Good morning. Good morning. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Worship with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura. I greet the good people here in the sanctuary and all who are Zooming or streaming in to this service with us today. It is good to be with you again in all the ways that we are learning to create community in getting close to the downside of COVID time. Our theme for the month of October is courage, which sociologist Brene Brown tells us comes from the Latin word, the Latin root core. And in, in one of its very first meanings, it meant to speak one's mind by telling one's heart. Though that definition has changed over time, today I invite us all into the kind of courage it takes to speak the truth from our hearts. And one of the tasks we take on in this liberal religious tradition is acknowledging the legacies that we have inherited. And so we find time in each service to remember that the land that we dwell upon before it was colonized, was the home of the Chumash peoples. Their descendants still dwell here. And in this church, in this church and all around us. So let us hold in our hearts the deep truths of these legacies that are now ours to carry. Couple of announcements. Uh, first, our annual fundraiser auction kicks off next Saturday and it is already breaking records. We have more than 160 items to bid on, more than ever before and um, also today we have, there's all kinds of artwork and much of it is on display in Berg Hall um, and so on your way out to coffee hour, uh, grab bagels, grab stuff, don't get any cream cheese on the artwork. Um, but take a look at it and figure out what maybe you're going to uh, bid on. And today is the last day to RSVP. We've already, we're already breaking records on the number of people who are coming. We want everyone to be able to be there and be welcome. And RSVPing would be really helpful for us to be able to do that abundantly. Um, and the Intrepid auction team that's been working very hard is counting on some people to come early to set up and stay late to tear down for our big auction event. Uh, there are a few people signed up and I tell them to trust that our good folks will show up because we do and letting them know you're able to do that would put some, uh, some anxieties to rest. Also, just to let you know that Carolyn, the Reverend Carolyn Price is back. And she, we have um, been able to secure her services for um, part time for a few months. And then she is, we're still working on it, but the plan is that she will be uh, the sabbatical replacement minister when I leave on sabbatical in March, that mid to late March. And her first Sunday with us back is going to be next Sunday. So don't miss that one. And then last week after the service, somebody came up and asked me if it was okay to shout out a hallelujah or an amen now and again. And I said, yes, of course it is. Even though I know that we sometimes can come across as God's frozen people. And I welcome, just want you to know, I welcome any and all thawing you are inspired to express. So can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> I love it. All of it. Thank you. And so now I invite you all to arrive fully here now in this place. You have courageously found your way here 
in person or online. And so may our hearts come together as we enter sacred space. Good morning. Good morning. I am Worship Associate Zena Kingshill. We invite those who are Zooming or streaming into this service to light a chalice or candle at home as Reverend Dana lights the chalice of our free faith here in the sanctuary. We begin our service with these words from Reverend Leslie Avuva Fales. All that we have been separately and all that we will become together is stretched out before and behind us like stars scattered across a canvas of sky. We stand at the precipice, arms locked together like tandem skydivers, working up the courage to jump. Tell me, friends, what have we got to lose? Our fear of failure? Our mistrust of our own talents? What have we got to lose? A poverty of the spirit? The lie that we are alone? What wonders await us in the space between the first leap and the moment our feet, our wheels, however we move our bodies across this precious earth, touch down softly on unknown soil? What have we got to lose that we can't replace with some previously unimaginable joy? Come, let us worship together. Good morning and welcome. I am Carolyn Bierke, the music director, and I want to welcome you all here in the sanctuary and online. Our opening hymn is Just As Long As I Have Breath. Please join me and rise in body or spirit with singing. all of the children and youth to come on up here for the story 
it is such a great gift to have you here to join us. And I've got one about angry, anger. Yeah? Any of you ever been angry? <laughs> Come on down here. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about it a little bit together. Yeah. Welcome, welcome. It is lovely, lovely, lovely to see you. Okay, so a little bit about anger. Have any of you ever gotten so mad that you couldn't stop yourself from yelling? Anybody? Okay. Have you couldn't, and maybe even you couldn't even stop yourself from yelling at somebody? Anybody? Maybe even saying some really mean things. We have all been there. I know you have too. It's okay. You're up front. It's, it's fine. You get to just. But I have a story about um, someone named Hannah. Its story is called Hannah and the Wind. It is an old Jewish folk tale uh, about a way, perhaps, to let your anger go before anybody gets hurt, including you. Because when we get angry, sometimes we, feel, we end up feeling hurt, too. I don't like it when I say mean things, so I end up feeling badly. OK, so Hannah finished doing her laundry at the village well and carried the wet clothing home to hang it on the clothesline. She didn't have a front or a backyard, so the clothesline was in the courtyard she shared with her neighbor. The clothes began to dance in the wind. Hannah watched for a little while and then went inside to start dinner. So whenever the wind blows in this story, whenever I talk about the wind blowing, I invite everyone to make windy sounds. So can we practice some windy sounds? So there's the, the laundry dancing in the wind. And a few minutes later, Hannah's neighbor, Sarah, rushed out of her door. She was late getting dinner together, and she went off to her vegetable patch to fix some food for supper. She was running late, and she didn't look where she was going. And she ran straight into L Hannah's wet laundry. Ew! And something snapped inside of her. This was too much. <laughs> so she grabbed the knife in her basket, and she just cut down that clothesline. And she watched with satisfaction as the wind blew. The wind blew all the clean clothes tumbling right on to the ground. And then she hurried off to her garden. A few minutes later, Hannah opened the front door to fetch a few herbs growing in a pot outside. And she saw all her formerly clean clothes on the ground. She couldn't believe it. She clenched her fists and she started to march over to Sarah's door. And she was going to pound on that door until Sarah answered. And she had a thing or two to say. But just then, a little gust of wind blew through the courtyard in gusts and swirls. And Hannah remembered that Sarah was having a pretty hard time these days. She was a single mom, and she had three hungry kids to feed. And Hannah, somehow, she unclenched her fists. And she picked up all the clothes, took them back to the well for rinsing, and squeezed out all the water she could. And back in the, in the courtyard, she tied the clothesline back up, hung up all the laundry again, and went back to fixing dinner. She hummed a tune as she chopped vegetables and kneaded the bread. And the tune sounded a bit like the wind. And when 
her mate got home, Hannah was about to tell her the story of her afternoon when the wind seemed to whistle through the house as he opened the door. Instead of telling the angry story, Santa, Hannah sat with her husband to watch the sunset and the gentle movement of the trees in the wind. And meanwhile, Sarah was having a miserable day. She fretted while she worked in the garden. Why had she been so mean and cut down the clothesline? When she cut home, she was happy to see the clothes hanging again. But once inside, she couldn't stop pacing back and forth. She was worried about what Sarah would say to her. And again and again, she thought she heard Sarah's footsteps uh, outside. But now the sun was setting, and Hannah still hadn't come. Oh, dear, she thought. Now I have to go over and ask for forgiveness. Great. <sighs> so she crossed the courtyard, carefully moving aside the clothes that were still on the line. She knocked timidly on Hannah's door. When Hannah answered, Sarah was so surprised. Hannah wasn't scowling. In fact, her face lit up with a great big smile. Sarah started to apologize, but Hannah just took her hand. Today, I have learned something important. The wind doesn't just dry clothes. The wind doesn't just dry clothes. The wind can sweep can blow anger away. So, anybody here in front, anybody want to shout out, what kind of things that you do when you are angry to maybe make it a little bit better? What do you do, rather than just yelling and stomping your feet, what do you do that makes it maybe a little bit easier? Somebody counts to 10. People breathe. Go for a walk. Do the dishes. OK, OK. You guys don't have to do the dishes when you're angry. That might just make you angry, right? I have to do the dishes, too. And anything that you do, do you go out and take a long walk, swing on a swing? Think about those things. You know what I do? I go out to the ocean. I love that we live so close to the beach, and I let the wind <laughs> blow through my hair and blow the anger away. And you all have some pretty good hair to blow, you know, maybe, you know how that can feel just to have the wind blow? And those of you who have less hair, may the wind just <laughs> caress your supremely um, bald head beautifully, supremely bald head, and let it just blow the anger away. Sometimes it even works. Sometimes it even works. So there are some fun things to do outside today. There are some arts and crafts, and there's some pickleball. And so what we are going to do now is sing you on your way out to your activities through a bridge of love. And so will all of you rise and face the center in the center aisle, if you will form a bridge of love with your hands, and we're going to sing our, you on your way out. You can go right through the bridge of love there. Behold you in a love as you go, as you go. May your heart be at peace as you go. To nurture the spark of your precious life. We hold you in our Each Sunday, this congregation gives away our whole collection to an organization in the larger community or to funds that help people in our own church. 
And those of you who are at home have two ways to give. If you're on Zoom, the link to give will be posted in the chat. And also you can text from your phone uh, the number that is currently up on the screens. Folks who are present can text to give or you can still write a, a check or give cash and drop it in the basket which is at the back of the sanctuary right there after the service. Today our offering goes to our own in-reach funds. I have told you I often call this our Say Yes Fund because it allows us as a congregation to say yes to people who are in need. Yet, I also think of it as an instrument of the grace of the church. Often when people ask for help, especially people who are members or friends or somehow part of our church, and often they will promise they will pay it back. And that's when I get to tell them, it doesn't work that way. You don't have to pay this back. In fact, you can't pay it back. This funds allows us to say, yes, you are in need and we can help. This is our good gift freely given. It's not, it can't be freely given if there's any obligation attached to it uh, or created by it. Indeed, having to pay it back just continues the burden that it is intended to lift. And here's the other thing, grace happens. Sometimes it just happens and sometimes it is in the form of a gift here, here, here we can help. We ask no return. And yet, if a recipient finds themselves on more solid ground at some future point, they are very welcome to give to the fund. Yet they should know they are not paying anything back. That door is shut. They can't. But rather, they are paying forward for someone else who will most certainly be in need sometime in the future. This is how grace swirls and eddies, never backward, always forward. And so thank you for giving generously, as you always do.
so the offertory is the piece of music that it traditionally is uh, played at a church when the offering baskets are passed, right? In order to give time for people to give, uh, to, to put their, make their donation. And, you know, technology has just taken us past that time. So, but isn't it also still lovely to have a piece of music to sit and listen to and I hope your heart is filling up with grace and generosity and love and, and feeling just lovely and powerful and generous and good and strong. Amen. Can we get another amen? amen. Yeah. <laughs> we are always ever so grateful for the generosity of this congregation, which weaves a tapestry of love it blows the threads all around and creates this beautiful tapestry of love we call community. Now is the time in the service when we hold up the great joys and sorrows that grace our lives. We place stones in water for both the celebrations and sorrows in our hearts, making ripples that are felt throughout our community. You can submit a joy or sorrow via a link on the website, uuventura.org, or a link in our Thursday email bulletin, UUCV This Week. Those received by 10 o'clock on Saturday night will be shared that Sunday. I invite you now to speak into the gathered community or write into the Zoom chat the names of those you wish to celebrate or memorialize or those in need of the loving embrace of this beloved community. Please feel free to continue to add to the chat even after the silent pause has ended. Reverend Dana will now place one final stone into the water for all the joys and sorrows yet unspoken in the silent sanctuary of our hearts. May we truly be grateful for all that is our life. Seated while we sing our meditative hymn, Comfort Me. with me 
Our reading this morning is a meditation on courage and vulnerability from Reverend Douglas Taylor. I am learning to let down my guard. We all know about the deep instinct to respond to difficulty and stress with either fight or flight, with force or swift retreat, with decisive attack or prompt withdrawal. When faced with stress or difficulty or challenge, I am learning to let down my guard. I am learning to be vulnerable. I am seeking the courage to be open. I would have my vulnerability be a choice made from my courage rather than my fear. I would have my vulnerability be my strength. May my strength be not found as a hard shell of defense or a sharp weapon of attack. May my strength instead be found in an open stance of kindness and empathy, like a tree bending gracefully in the wind storm. May my strength be found in a willingness to join in the suffering of others, like a forest of trees together in a storm. May I choose to be receptive rather than protected, sharing rather than shielded. In this way, may my vulnerability be an invitation for others to meet me in the open field with a yearning for understanding and peace. I will seek the courage to set aside the closed fist, the stinging retort, the barbed judgment of others. I will seek within myself the strength to stand exposed and unguarded before the world. In the wind, open to difficulty, not because I cannot be any other way, but because I have chosen this better way. I invite you now into a time of stillness meditation. Close your eyes if you wish or simply soften your gaze. Sit quietly. Notice your breathing. Let it fall into unnatural rhythm. How and when are you courageous? How and when are you most vulnerable? May the wind blow through it all. Whoosh. A silent meditation.
Thank you, Arturo. That is such a gift. Thank you. While I was still teaching school up in the Bay Area before the whole church and ministry thing happened, I used to love a segment on local public radio up there called Perspectives. They'd have a regular person from the community offer some wisdom or insight in about three minutes in, in, in about a three minute reflection. And I used to fantasize about sending the station some of my own wit and wisdom, though I never did. And little did I know that I would soon have a practice of offering far longer segments of wisdom and hopefully inspiration on a nearly weekly basis. It was one of those things looking back, it was like, oh yeah, ministry, that was, that was starting to happen, starting to call. So Marilyn Englander, a teacher and writer from Marin, offered this perspective a few years, a few years ago. We all experience small, everyday incidents that make someone, often ourselves, disproportionately angry. <sighs> I am idling at the street, at, at the wheel behind a couple of cars at a stop sign. A few seconds tick by, and then the driver in front of me explodes with, fur with a furious bleat of honks. He's jerking back and forth in agitation. And I think, why isn't that car up front moving? And I lift my hand to add my horn to the protest. When I glimpse an elderly woman painfully creeping to the end of the crosswalk, she makes the curb at last. Cars move forward. My face flushes in shame. In mere seconds, I've generated a great deal of anger. Yet the incident was so insignificant be curious, not furious, I chant to myself. But it is a challenging discipline. I have to mentally transport myself to the other side of a chasm, and the other side of a chasm of anger, and look back from the other person's point of view. If I can allow curiosity to nudge aside my anger, suddenly a whole new perspective opens. 
I can take a few beats, breathe, and pose a few questions. To make it a first impulse to, be, to inquire, to be generous enough to ask why, takes a lot of practice. But saying, tell me what happened here, or please explain, opens the door to empathy. Be curious, not furious. Now, I am not overly fond of pithy phrases dispensing wisdom. But somehow I am taken with this one. Sometimes I can even remember in the moment when irritation or defensiveness spikes. Be curious, not furious. We live in a culture that has been living on the edge for decades now. On the edge, on an edge, just on edge. And the pandemic has only added to this. Road, road rage has been, for, been with us, I think, maybe as long as we had cars. Because it is so easy to explode from the inside of the little bubble of our cars, even as we're hurtling 70 miles an hour down the freeway. And now it is easy to explode from within the bubble and relative anonymity of Twitter, Instagram, or our TikTok accounts. In this congregation, we have a covenant of right relations that was written to guide us, especially in times of conflict and challenge. It was approved by the congregation in March of 2003. It is an aspirational, even daunting statement of how we want to be together. Just a few highlights. I promise to trust that the basic motives of our members are positive. I promise to maintain a sense of humor. <laughs> I promise to avoid making assumptions and generalizations about the beliefs of others to create and maintain an atmosphere which invites feedback and allows everyone to speak. I promise to listen with respect and without interruption to the ideas, beliefs, and feelings of others, to avoid being distracted by anger or an agenda to persuade, debate, or win. Good big stuff. The daunting part for me is the language of promise. These are all things I definitely aspire to and I'm gonna try my best. But as it is written, I know that I break most of those promises on a regular basis. I am mostly good at seeing the humor in situations, but when certain buttons get pushed, all my laughter boils away in an instant. And good golly, but I'm an interrupter. Even as I am conscious of it, and I'm working on it constantly, really, truly, constantly, I still do it. And this points to what I find missing in our current 20-year-old covenant. It lacks a process of accountability, what we do to repair when the covenant is broken. Even with the very best of intentions, people still hurt one another. We can try to trust positive motives, but that's hard when someone hits a button, touches an old wound. 
and assuming good intentions has its way of putting the onus on the person who is hurting. Oh, I'm hurting like crazy over here, but I know they didn't mean it. That's a pretty hard place to, to, to rest, to be in. It takes a lot of practice. And it's been 20 years since that covenant was written and this covenantal faith, we've been working on covenant. And in those 20 years, the concept of covenant and how we have a covenant together and how covenants guide us, we've learned some stuff since then. And it seems a good time to revisit our covenant. Just, and I want to share with you some parts of one of the best covenants I've ever been part of creating. It was from a recent Wellspring group. I just share with you two of the items on it. Consider all voices. We will center the voices of those, especially who have been marginalized and disenfranchised. We will avoid generalizing about any groups of people or asking anyone to speak for an entire group that they are a part of. We will speak from our own lived and learned experience. Own both our intentions and our impact on others. We will respect each other's experiences and feelings by taking responsibility for the effects of our words on others. We will be open to dialogue and practice curiosity. We will get curious, not furious. Yep, I contributed that last line. Someone with the very best of intentions can still say or do something hurtful to another. Most often this is out of ignorance and or sometimes even cluelessness rather than any kind of willful meanness. But when my very well intended, if clueless, speech or action hurts someone else, I cannot rest on those good intentions. I may be completely surprised that someone was hurt. I have sometimes hurt people when my actual intention was to support and affirm. Yet for me, in those moments, I need to, rather than get defensive or angry, well, I didn't mean it that way, I can try to be curious. Tell me what's, what's happening here. Please explain what didn't set right about what I just said. It's hard to remember to do this on both sides when somebody pushes our buttons and then when we're told about it and we get defensive. But breathing, letting the wind blow. This is not a practice generally encouraged or supported in our culture, partly because it makes us vulnerable and the, our overall cultural message is to bluster and, and defend, admit no fault, start from a place of strength, and never give in. So some of you have heard me talk about my younger dog, Jasper, who um, has gotten into a very bad habit of uh, barking and lunging at other dogs and sometimes even at people. And when, this, when it got to the people part, I realized I needed help and I talked to a trainer who said to me, pointed out all the ways it's very clear that Jasper is really just afraid. And what I'm also discovering, I'm working with him a lot on it, what I'm also discovering is that he is an incredibly smart and very well-trained dog, except when he is startled or feels threatened, and then all of that training just goes flying out the window, and he lunges and barks, and I need to break that cycle, and oh, we are working on it. This helps me see that underneath our anger, all of our anger, is usually a fear of some kind, a sadness, a wound, 
acknowledging that in ourselves and each other is the beginning of healing. And yet that is difficult and it can be scary. I'm sorry. Please tell me how I hurt you, how I can make it better is a very vulnerable statement. Allowing ourselves to be that vulnerable is not a high value in our culture. But sociologist Brene Brown tells us, vulnerability is not about winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. Vulnerability is not weakness. It is our greatest measure of strength. In his meditation on courage and vulnerability, the Reverend Doug Douglas Taylor speaks of how he is learning to be courageous through being vulnerable. We all know about the deep instinct to respond to difficulty and stress with either fight or flight force or a swift retreat with decisive attack or prompt withdrawal. When faced with stress or difficulty or challenge, I am learning, he says, to let down my guard. I am learning to be vulnerable. I would have my vulnerability be a choice made from my courage rather than my fear. I would have my vulnerability be my strength. I will seek the courage to set aside the closed fist, the stinging retort, the barbed judgment of others. I will seek within myself the strength to stand exposed, unguarded before the world, in the wind, open to difficulty, not because I cannot be any other way, but because I have chosen this better way. And ultimately, it is all about relationships, which is what our covenants are about. They point us toward being together in human community with as complex people, with courageous kindness and open hearts, with wounds and fears and grief, and with a willingness to acknowledge mistakes and repair them. Whew. As the wise sage Anonymous has said, apologizing does not always mean that you are wrong or and the other person is right. Apologizing just means that you value your relationship more than your ego. Mm -hmm. Creating community from the place of valuing relationship and being vulnerable rather than defensive is a tall order and it's why we're here or at least one of the really big reasons. And it's not easy. Yet ultimately, it can comfort the soul. Though it also means saying yes and making our way through pain, even piercing disappointment and still saying yes to life, to truth and to love. It is what invites our hearts ultimately into a holy place together. It is a spiritual practice and it is a spiritual practice that happens in the community. It is a way we can learn and grow and heal and make ginormous big mistakes again and learn and grow and heal and make smaller mistakes the next time and learn and grow and heal and remember to let the wind blow through the ocean breezes, blow through our souls and heal and hold them.
May we all learn courage, the courage and strength to be vulnerable and real and human and whole with one another. Amen. And may it be so. Hallelujah over here, too. That was good. Yeah. Thank you. Please join me in prayer. Holy beingness of many names and no name, spirit of courage and kindness and saying yes to life, may we offer our tender hearts into one another's care. May we look for this sweet, vulnerable shyness at the heart of each one of us. May we take good care, apologizing when needed and even perhaps when not exactly needed. May we find our strength in our own vulnerability and may we share that strength with one another. Our strength, uh, the power of our vulnerability shared with one another and with all the world. And may all those who are ill find healing. May those who are in despair find hope. May those who are without shelter find home. And may all those suffering conflict and war throughout the world, may they, may we all find peace. Amen and blessed be. Please rise and body your spirit and join me in our closing hymn, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. Please join me in reading the words on the screen as we prepare to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. Those we carry into our lives 
until we are together again. I invite all of those, everyone remain standing for the, if, if you are, as you are, <laughs> for the benediction and postlude. Um, but before then, I will, I want to invite the people who are on Zoom into breakout rooms, turn in your screens, look around. And those here, if you have cash or checks for the offering, please drop them in the basket at the back. And then head on out for coffee hour outside. And on your way out, the artwork from, that is available uh, for bidding on in the auction is in Berg Hall. Take a gander. Start considering what your bids will be. And what you want to bid on and how much you're willing to bid. I leave you with the words that we began, that began our service. For we are always standing at some precipice, summoning the courage to jump, face the unknown in these vulnerable bodies. And so, may we stand at the precipice, arms locked together like tandem skydivers, working up the courage to jump. Ah. Tell me, friends, what have we got to lose? our fear of failure, our mistrust of our own talents, a poverty of spirit, the lie that we are alone. What wonders await us in the space between the first leap and the moment we touch down softly on unknown soil? What have we got to lose that we can't replace with some previously unimaginable joy. We are in this together. Let us take the leap, yet never alone. Go forth in love, go forth in peace. May it be so.